Yeah. What a magnificent demonstration. Thank you so much. It's absolutely yeah. brilliant. So we're now here um, in the uh, MMEE, the Midlands Model Engineering, Engineering Exhibition, that's it. with James again from the Gas Turbine mm -hmm. Builders Build Association. Build Association. That's it. James is going to talk us through uh, some of some of your kit. Some of the you have uh, on some display. of our display yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have actually what we try to show or try to demonstrate to people is that. This is not the domain of the rich and famous. Uh, what we try to encourage is the average modeler who just has that desire to have his own jet engine, whether he just wants it for display, uh, just for a bit of fun, or actually put it into something such as a model aircraft, or in the case of uh, the far side of the stand here, we have a, a model train. Uh, but it all started back in the early 1990s uh, with this engine here. This is called the FD3. Now the interesting thing with this, the design was that it could be built by an average modeler. And the interesting thing about it, uh, which many people actually find difficult to fathom, is the compressor is fabricated out of plywood. It's got carbon fiber formed around the tips to help hold it together. The turbine is actually made out of sheet stainless steel, which has been cut, twisted and formed. And despite this apparent crude uh, construction, this engine still could achieve 75,000 RPM with a wooden compressor and would produce four pounds of thrust. Now, the um, unusual thing with this, as you can imagine, with wood, uh, it has a finite strength. Yeah. Uh, and even with the carbon fiber wrapping around it, uh, there was a limit. Uh, and you did need to control it to the, uh, because if it went over 80,000 RPM, so there was not much give there, um, it would stop working. Right. Um, and I, it didn't explode, it was a very, very gentle um, destruction. It would expand in its housing, would it, and what just it sort would of do lock up? Is you'd, it's almost here just like a, a puff noise, <laughs> as the compressor turned into cotton wool, wood fibre. <laughs> wood fibre, so okay. all of us, you know, You'd look in the front end and think someone had just stuffed a whole load of cotton wool inside it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and then this so, is this so is this the, actually the next yeah. one. What people did from here yeah. was keep. If you look, essentially, it's the same engine. So if I bring this one over the top of this one, yeah, okay, you can see essentially the same intake. But now the compressor has been replaced by a milled compressor of very similar design, and that was done by hand on the mill. And again, we've still got the same turbine, but you'll notice what was a coil of a vaporizer, which never worked properly because the holes all the way along it allowed fuel to be still be burning as it came out the back end. So it, it didn't look good and it wasn't efficient. So what we then did is actually added a different vaporizer system, which is called a hockey stick. Uh, for obvious reasons. Yes, looks like the a hockey lucky, stick. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely yeah. right. So that then brought all the fuel, burning fuel, to the very front of the combustion chamber so as we could then add the remaining air because all we are using is approximately 18 to 20 percent of the air that comes in the front to actually combust. The rest of it we're using that flame to heat the other 82 percent. Okay. <laughs> okay? To make it expand. So this was still you know, not very efficient, particularly because the compressor couldn't move enough air to produce a particularly heavy thrust. And as time went by, the availability of turbochargers on cars and trucks meant that we were able to get hold of turbocharger compressors, which you can now see has much more complicated veins, they're much thinner, and we can move much, much more air more efficiently than we could on either of the homemade versions earlier. Also, in the meantime, uh, we developed uh, patterns for the turbine. So now we have turbines cast out of Inconel, which is uh, a special material, high in nickel, 
which means that it will not expand or stretch at high temperatures and the high RPMs, the, the centrifugal forces uh, that these wheels experience. So unlike the old stainless steel, which used to gradually expand in size and just stop, now we can actually have an engine that will run and run and run and will not come to a grinding halt. Even at those hotter temperatures. Even at the hotter temperatures, yeah. 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 So yeah. we're able to run. So, much so you've avoided thermal expansion sure, problems. Yeah. You, and you, earlier you mentioned that you have um, some very special bearings inside here. Yep, yeah, well. yeah. and you can see where they're located. Yeah. One immediately behind the compressor here, and the other one you can see just here, right in front of the turbine. Now, as before, the fuel in this particular instance is squirted from a little uh, ring around here, squirted using uh, hypodermic needles down into these tubes. So air and fuel mixes down here, but because of the heat of the air around these tubes, the kerosene vaporizes and it mixes with the air. So this and is a replacement for the hockey sticks, the, yes, which was yeah, a replacement for the for tube. The tube. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So now what's happening is the it's much easier to make because it's a, just a straight tube as opposed to having to form hockey sticks and whatever. Uh, but the outlet is now right at the front of the combustion chamber here. And once the ignition happens at the very beginning of the start, that flame never goes out. Okay. So all we're doing is adding a, a burnable mix, a combustible mix of fuel and air, constantly adding it to that donut of fire, which is moving around this area of the co combustion chamber. And that flame is uh, approximately, is under, uh, just under 2,000 degrees centigrade. <laughs> Ouch. Yes. But because we're only using you know, up to 20% of the air that's come in the front end, that is used essentially almost like a primus yeah. to heat up all the rest of the air, that 82% of the air that's coming in all of the bigger holes around the outside and also if you can see the inside of the combustion chamber. So the air is not only coming out here, but also forming around. So it's, it's uh, a pressurized cylinder, and air works its way around, and the only way to get to the turbine is through all of these holes. Now, now you seem to have a very specific pattern of holes on your combustion uh, chamber. Uh, yep. So what's the reasoning behind those? Okay, those the holes? reasoning behind those is uh, any uh, flame cannot stay in one place at too great a speed. Okay. So there, there, there's an actual, what they call uh, a flame propagation speed, uh, beyond which the flame would be blown away. So what we, the, all these holes actually control the amount of air to certain parts of the combustion chamber. So we only have a tiny, tiny amount of holes at the front here. Most of the air comes in down through these tubes and we also have these diagonal holes which help keep that donut around and around that space and that's all running at the speed that the flame can maintain at that space. Then we have these other holes a bit further back and they are what's called the secondary zone. So you have the combustion zone, then we have the secondary zone which if there's any fuel that has not burned in the primary zone that will just add a little bit extra air just to make sure the remaining sure. bits are burned off. Yeah. Yeah. And then we come to what's the, the third zone, which is actually known as the dilution zone. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're diluting that hot gases from almost 2,000 degrees down to an inlet temperature of the turbine of 850 degrees. Okay. So between that distance, we've got a drop yeah. of over 1,200 degrees. And that's because we're you know, introducing a large amount of air, it's taking all that heat, and it's expanding as well at the same time. And you can see it hits these blades here, which guides it into the turbine at the optimum angle, so as the turbine gets the maximum torque in order to drive the compressor. Which then sucks which the then air sucks back in again exactly. and the process continues. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, yeah. what, what's not necessarily uh, appreciated is this is still a four-stroke engine. It's a four-cycle engine. Because we are actually inducing, mm -hmm. compressing, mm -hmm. igniting, igniting, and exhausting. And exhausting, yeah. It, all at the same time. And that's why this engine, because it's not pulsing, 
those four cycles, it's doing all of them at exactly the same time, which is why the engine is so light, but is so powerful. So those are the blades. Wow. Each one is individual. If you hold your hand out, each one weighs 0.2 of a gram. Weighs nothing. <laughs> yeah. What's Absolutely. Height, it, it's a castable grade of high tensile aluminium. Uh, this, this is the cold end, this is the compressor. So it'll only run at about 200 degrees, which is well within the operational parameters of aluminium. Suck, that squeeze, bang, bang blow. <laughs> exactly. That's <yeah>. the one. <laughs> James, thank you so much. It's absolutely fascinating. What a wonderful Pleasure. world you live in. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Pleasure. <Cheers. laughs>